Ladies and gentlemen, let's start our conference again. Welcome you all. This is the 12th section of this Congress. Before that, uh, please be reminded that uh, CS, uh, the Consumers International Voting Pack, is ready for pickup. Please go to room G112, that is the CI Secretariat Office, to pick up your voting pack uh, by, uh, from 6 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. Please collect it by today. The topic for this session is consumer rights, past, present, and future. We have two speakers. First is Mr. Anwar Fashal, who is the civil society leader and former CI president. He will make the speech first. So we invite Mr. Fashal to come on stage. Brothers and sisters, assalamu alaikum and welcome to this session. There are more people coming in, but there are a lot of empty seats. And it reminds me of a time when there was a conference where the speaker found there was only one person sitting in front. So after he finished and went up to thank this person for staying for his speech, the person said, don't thank me, I'm the next speaker. <laughs> There's still a few more coming. Yes, we'll get them all seated up. You know, the, one of the greatest books about the consumer movement was published by the Consumers Union of the United States, and it had a wonderful title. It was called Test and Protest. <laughs> Test and Protest. And it was done uh, in the 70s, and it told the story about the Consumers Union. And I thought uh, today, since it's four o'clock, I will start with a test. I will start with a test. And I want to do an extremely simple test and that is with a product that all of you are familiar with. And this product is a roll of toilet paper. A roll of toilet paper. And I'm going to give you a multiple choice question to get your feedback on what you think is the length of the paper that is inside this particular roll. And you have Three choices, I make it easy. Is it five meters long? Is it 10 meters long? Is it 15 meters long? Huh? This is roughly the kind of images, yeah? Five meters, 10 meters, and 15 minutes. 15 meters. All those for 15 meters stand up. Okay, thank you very much. All those for 10 meters, stand up. One more, yes. Sit down, thank you. And all those for five meters, stand up. Thank you, good. Well, the good news, the good news is that you are normal consumers, which means you can say, conscientiously ignorant. <laughs> the vast majority of you were wrong. The vast majority of you wrong. And in some cases, very often, most wrong. Huh? But in this case, at least you were better than many other groups. Uh, the bulk of you were them. I mention this because it is a symbol of how we are so disconnected with sometimes the most obvious things that we use daily. Why? Because very often we use it in small pieces and we never know the total quantity. Two, we don't even think about it because our mind is on uh, other things. And yet, the toilet tissue issue 
can be the subject of a movie, can be the subject of a movie in terms of the impact on forests, the impact in terms of waste, sewage systems. There is now a wonderful book called The Big Necessity. There is a WTO, the World Toilet Organization, as against the World Trade Organization. There is a World Toilet Conference every two years. And there is a World Toilet College. Believe it or not, just Google, those of you who have got a machine, there is a World Toilet Day. Because what they found was that in some of the most obvious things in our life, we don't even pay attention to them. Uh, and that's been the story of consumers. So, so much that we have to have, of course, consumer organizations to help us, to help us find our way and to become more aware. If, if, an intergalactic organization was set up to have a commission of inquiry into the state of consumers on planet Earth. What would they say when they look at Earth in totality? Well, the report will say, well, Mr. President of the Consumers Union, Jim Guest, they might address the report to him and have a heading at the beginning. If you have dreams, the first and most important thing is to wake up and then do something. <laughs> That's the heading of their report. And then they state the state of what, of the kind of world we live in as consumers. And they treat all earthlings as consumers, because that is a function we are performing 24 times 7 times 365 all the time. We're consuming air, drinking water, buying, you know, it's, it's our consumption. Our consumption patterns are very total and complete. And what will they find? One of the things they will find is, say, we can't understand you guys, the violence in this earth. One person commits suicide every 40 seconds. One person is murdered every 60 seconds. One person is killed in war every 100 seconds. And most of the people who are killed in the new wars are civilians, many of them women and children. You say, ah, what a country, what a, what a planet. In, uh, in and then they say, ah, consumers, you know, our latest statistics that have been provided to us, there are now more people on the planet that are obese than those that are suffering from hunger and malnutrition. What kind of world is this? Yeah, where you have this tremendous distortion you know, of uh, both ends not functioning. And they look and said, my God, you know, one of the latest reports that we have received is the nuclear disaster in Fukushima. Don't you remember Chernobyl? 25 years ago, the International Organization of Consumers Union, Consumers International now, passed a resolution on Chernobyl and said that the world must relook at nuclear energy and there must be an international convention, there must be more controls. But we have to rethink You've forgotten what you did even 25 years ago, and now what's happening? How much did Chernobyl cost? Do you know it takes? Yeah? And they had the figures. And someone said 208 billion, billion, billion US dollars had to be spent just to clean up Chernobyl. Look at the amount of money. And now with Fukushima, what have you got? Already, already the kind of commitments that are being made are 300 billion US dollars. I said, oh my God, you know, what kind of world is this that you are spending money on things that you should have been very careful about? Yeah? And of course, they said, we've also been informed by the World Health Organization that all it requires is $2.5 billion, just $2.5 billion to make sure that every child has health and education, uh, children who are deprived can have 
the health and education. That's all that is required. And how much are you spending on the cleanup of this nuclear energy system? 2.8 billion, and that's 280 billion, 300 billion. I mean, just amazing, they said. You know, that you, you don't seem to be able to run your, run your household. Anyway. And this amount of 2.8, uh, they look at statistics. Of course, they use statistics that they can get, and very often the United States keeps good statistics, Europe keeps good statistics, and they say, well, it's 2.8 billion to make sure that all deprived children of the world can have basic health and basic education is about the amount that the United States spends on one month on cigarettes. Or about, or about what Europe spends on alcohol in a month, yeah? It's amazing kinds of figures, yeah? that you can see how uh, these distortions are. And then they will say, fourth thing, just sheer militarism, yeah? We thought you, you had your wars already, you know, and that you would have learned from those wars, and yet you spend you know, more than $800 billion on armaments a, a, a year, and it's increasing, and more and more wars seem to be a, a necessity. Yeah, that uh, actually benefits that particular industry because the more wars are, the more business there is uh, for, for them. And then they look also and say, hey, the gross national criminal product is one of the fastest growing, growing rates. Huh? Huh? That is, the criminal industries are the ones that are growing much, much faster than anything else. They said, ha, ha. You know, what a world uh, that we, we, we have. Yeah? And of course, we know about the fin uh, financial uh, scandals and uh, uh, the drug trade, uh, pornography, uh, the, the um, uh, gambling, and many, many other things that are continuing. And uh, the new technologies that we made have even made some of these type of things uh, easier. And they, they will, of course, note, you know, most recent information about $100 billion that uh, US firms uh, spend outside, they make in the United States, but keep outside the country in what are now called treasure islands. Yeah? And you can look at treasureislands.org and find how uh, the world system of uh, laundering money uh, is operative in a very, very uh, big way. And, uh, and, and of course, the triple bottom line, they say that although people tell us, you know, that's supposed to be a triple bottom line, they say it's the same word. Money, money, and money, yeah, in, uh, in, in that. And you have, let's say, somebody tells us that maybe we should describe this as casino capitalism, yeah, uh, the kind of uh, financial systems that we are um, operating. So what is wrong with this world? They said, well, they said, you know, we have been looking for some suitable way of describing what is fundamentally wrong with the world. And you as consumers, in the end, Every one of these issues impacts on you because it takes money away from the pocket, it makes decisions uh, for you, it decides your welfare and it decides your, your future. And they were inspired, they say, by what Mahatma Gandhi once wrote. And this has been updated, this has been updated, and Mahatma Gandhi called this the seven social sins. They've been expanded by this Royal Commission to 11, since this is 2011, so you can easily remember. And they said, one, politics without principles. Two, wealth without work, enjoyment without conscience, knowledge without character, business without morality, science without humanity, religion without compassion, rights without responsibilities, power without accountability, development without sustainability, and lastly, laws without justice. Laws without justice. And this, they said, summarizes the huge governance dilemma that we have on this earth. So is there hope? What should consumers do? They so said, unless consumers remember this story, and they tell this story, and say, you look at a river and you see a baby drowning, you save that baby. And later you see another baby is drowning, you save another baby. But you don't have time to look up the river and deal with the person who's throwing the babies in the river. And that is, we forget 
looking at structural issues. And for the consumer movement, those structural issues, they say, will have to be as important as those little, little details that you need to deal with. And they will tell you another story. They say, if you are in a movement like this, you have to have a vision. And that vision has to be long-term thinking. And they give the illustration that you see a person, several persons laying bricks. They are making a building. You ask the first person, what are you doing? He said, I'm laying a brick. You ask the second person, what are you doing? He said, I'm building a school. I'm building a school, you know? His mindset is different. You ask the third person, what are you? he said, I am trying to make a better future for our children. Yeah? So he's even got another bigger vision. And this is this kind of thinking. And in the consumer movement, yeah, we have the people who only think very often of the bricklaying. Yeah? Uh, we have to have more and more people also who think about the school and the people who think about this long term. So is there, is there hope? Is there hope? This commission, this inter intergalactic commission says. They end up saying yes. They said every time, every time there are these kinds of issues, there is one hope. They say there is one hope. And that is civil society and that is people power. And they've seen it time and time again that the changes come from the people. Huh? And they come with the kind of passion and uh, vision that is very often necessary. So they say that if you want to make a move, you have to follow a formula, a new formula. And this is called A, B, C. Very simple to remember, isn't it? If a kid starts their life with ABC, they said, you as consumers have to become angry that so much of this kind of badness is going on. You really have to feel that kind of passion. How can you tolerate this kind of nonsense huh? of too big to fail and financial scandals and, you know, big corporations taking advantage of, you know, the issues with regard to health just completely uh, neglected. Yeah, the, the second is, you have to be brave, no? that you have to challenge the systems that need to be challenged. And third, the third, the C, is that you have to be a creative organization. You have to have that talent and that ability to be able to think in ways that can challenge the system creatively. And that is, they say, within the people's movements, an abundance of these things, an abundance. They say, you know, in all the movements, you need people, the head people, you need the heart people, and you need the hand people. Huh? Sometimes I use a different term. You need the PhDs, like Michael Hansen, you know. You need uh, uh, the BSTs. Yeah? Uh, that's the blood, sweat, and tears people. So you have your PhD, and then you can put the BSD, as Michael Hansen also has, you know. You have that. But you can have all the PhDs and all the knowledge and you can have all the passion. If you don't have GTD after your name, nothing will happen. And that is getting things done. <laughs> the people who can get things done. So every social movement that wants to engage itself in transformational struggles has to have that three elements, uh, the kind of PhD, uh, the kind of BSD, and the GTDs. Yeah? And if you have these three elements in your movement, then A, B, C is possible and can happen. And if you look at the consumer movement, things like that have happened. After we take the history of the consumer movement, and I'm supposed to talk about consumer rights, but our history goes back to 3,500 years ago with the Hittites in Anatolia. That's in Turkey, where they had the first fundamental, uh, you can say, two consumer rights. Thou shalt not poison thy neighbor's fat. Thou shalt not bewitch thy neighbor's fat. And this was one was about food safety, and one was about cheating and misleading. And this was a very fundamental uh, law. This was 3,000 years ago. And if you take a big quantum leap after, after that, you go down to 1906 in the United States. You had a wonderful story of a, uh, of a writer called Upton Sinclair who did a book called The Jungle, and uh, he was later a Pulitzer, Pulitzer Prize uh, winner. It was a magnificent book that told a story about factories and the rotten way in which packing meat, 
you know, food was being processed. And as a result of his expose and that book, a new pure food law was made in the United States. And here was uh, a, a journalist, yeah, a novelist, who can make transformational change. Yeah? And, and then if you go back most recent, and I'm taking a several quantum deep, just the stories that are important, if you remember the past of the consumer movement. In 1962, a remarkable young president, Kennedy, sent a message. The first time a head of state had actually made a message to Congress with regard to consumer issues. And there he talked about the rights of consumers. And incidentally, and Jim Guest will make a note, that uh, next year will be 50 years of Kennedy's message. And uh, because it's the 50 years of Kennedy's message, and that's World Consumer Rights Day, maybe finally we will take this message, celebrate it again after 50 years, go to the UN and say, you have got International Women's Day, you've got this day, Environment Day. We think it's about time you had the UN to declare officially the World Consumer Rights Day as a UN day. Yeah? So that will be one of the kind of agendas that we can go from that particular historic uh, moment. And then interestingly, thank you. and it's an opportunity not to be missed, huh? both celebrating the 50 years of Kennedy's uh, statement and to take it to the, uh, to the UN. Also interestingly, how things move in the UN, the first UN report, the first UN report on consumer protection came out of the International Labour Organization. Huh? It's interesting. Yeah? Came out of the Labour, International Labour Organization. It's called the Study Guide on Consumer Protection because they said workers can improve their consumer welfare by two ways. By one, spending their money wisely. Two, of course, by having more money. Huh? But they were looking at how workers themselves could and they did this very, very detailed in one of the best uh, initial documents uh, on, on, uh, from the UN itself. Uh, in, in the, and then that's very important to, to, uh, to remember because that led to a string of activities that led to the UN guidelines. And instantly, finally, when we got the United Nations to have uh, slightly watered down uh, UN guidelines, um, so little has been done. As an international labor organization, there's no international consumer organization you know, by the UN. There's a World Trade Organization so where they deliberately uh, make sure that consumers were not directly involved at all in the process. You know, you had to go on the streets and uh, demonstrate it was a business uh, government kind of uh, affair. Yeah? See how, how, how we moved out, we were moved out of the particular, particular system. And this year, this year is the 25th anniversary of the United Nations Guidelines and Consumer Protection. So again, another opportunity for us to begin something uh, for those uh, 25 years. So I mentioned these little points because each one of these little points tell us how we can build on the past for the, for the future. And I, I am not going to mention all the rights. You know, Kennedy had four. Uh, we found that in Europe, they, they talked about redress, they talked about education, and then the World Environment Conference is going on in 72 and Citizens Interna uh, Consumers International talked about our, our concerns for the environment, so the right to environment was added. The International Labour Organization talked about basic needs, the large numbers of people whose basic consumer needs were not being met. So we added a right called the right to basic needs, and these eight rights then, for the first time, were formally adopted, interestingly, in this region by organizations from ASEAN. Uh, that is the Southeast Asian uh, community of uh, nations for the first time, and then it got incorporated. And we decided also on our own, since UN is not yet moving in 1982 when I was president, we decided that we will celebrate World Consumer Rights Day, and it's been celebrated uh, since. So these rights now have become very, very special. But the most important thing is having got rights, Exercising those rights, eh? and that little thing right in front of that intergalactic commission where they say, you know, you have a dream, first thing to do is to wake up and do something. Yeah? <laughs> what do we do having all those rights? So organizing ourselves to put these rights into reality becomes a challenge. And what is happening? The fact that the UN Consumer Protection Guidelines are hardly noticed, hardly reviewed, is one of the signs of what's wrong at the moment, uh, that we have to take the ABC strategy. 
If you look at how, uh, you know, in reports about civil society activism globally, and one of the most interesting books a few years ago was Blessed Unrest, how global civil society is actually making an impact. Consumers International was not known in that particular book at that time. Obviously, we had missed out on the radar. Where we were active, the world wasn't, uh, wasn't there, which meant we were not connecting. We were not connecting with all the alliances and so on, which were very important for, for our work. But we built on this. We built with, uh, with uh, responsibility. We, we built up the idea of, uh, of consumer responsibilities that will go, and that's being, being critical, you know, being... Uh, uh, fighting for, for uh, you know, being active, you know, concepts of solidarity and uh, uh, all that. And one of the greatest things uh, when the consumer movement was the strongest was when we went into global networking. We set up networks before the word network was even talked about uh, in computers. Way back in the 1970s. The first consumer network was set up in 1979 around breastfeeding. What we did with this strategy was that we take issues, burning issues, and we build alliances that actually increase our strength, the Citizens International strength, by 10 times, by 100 times, by 1,000 times, you know, which was a model of working where, uh, I think we had one uh, video where we, we made arrangements for love affairs rather than marriage. You, know, you don't uh, have to have our own members necessarily carrying the burden. You had all kinds of alliances who were interested, labor groups, church groups, development aid groups, citizens, you know, uh, organizations, all kinds who said, this is a social justice issue that's important and we will work with you. And Citizens International developed a reputation of being the kind of hub that worked around on public interest issues uh, globally. And with this, it multiplied us a hundred times and thousand times. And we end up having, you know, a, a magnificent presence in the United Nations, in, in many, many social forums. And, and this kind of uh, platform where we shame uh, governments, we, we got a code, the first code on breastfeeding, we got a code on pharmaceuticals on the rational use, we got a code on pesticides uh, use, and we developed a mechanism called Consumer Interpol, where we could send alerts to all our member organizations before any UN agency or any government could do it. I mean, we were faster for them. We even used, in 1981, satellite communication. We, we arranged with a, a very progressive uh, news agency called IPS Interpress Service, and with them, we had time on uh, satellite communications when we were doing some of the campaigning. So always being ahead of technology. Uh, for me, in Penang, Malaysia, we were working, we had a fax machine, which was enormous cost at that time. I had to persuade the headquarters of Citizens International, please buy a fax machine. This is the new technology. This is how we communicate, you know? And after some persuasion, we manage. Yeah? And, and we had internet uh, connection in uh, 1987, yeah? very early in, uh, in that. When I had to dial to London or Australia to even make a connection. You can see how uh, we, we had to move. But, but we moved, yeah? and we moved, and, uh, and, and we were right in front of uh, the most advanced technology. But we never forgot one thing. Dot com must also not be replaced by Tom Tom. You know what is Tom Tom? The old drum drum. And it's like in Switzerland, they had the pigeon regiment, you know. Uh, if everything else fails, they had trained these pigeons to take messages to different parts of uh, uh, Switzerland. They kept the Pigeon State, uh, Pigeon Regiment until recently. We have also always to keep all the simple kinds of ways of communicating alive. You know? Empathy, person-to-person -person contact, because if you, it's not about rights and responsibilities, it's also about relationships. If you have movements, you must be a community, and a community must see each other, link with each other, feel for each other, you know? and that kinds of things very often are forgotten. And once you forget, you, you, you become a very personal link, and of course the new technologies enable uh, this kind of empathy to be established even through distance. So, communications was always very central. Alliance building was very uh, central. So, we have this problem about the 11 sins, this whole global. What can we do? I have also 11 suggestions. Eh? And these are suggestions that are being made by the Galactic, Intergalactic Commission saying, hey, maybe you should think about this. 
this ABC uh, new phase. One is project number one, crimes against the consumer. Crimes against the consumer. If we're everywhere in the world where people are treating consumers badly, and products and so on, let us have an organized system you know, where we tabulate and pu publish this and talk about that. Then industries, just like crimes against humanity. I mean, we have all the data, we have all the uh, information. Uh, very early already, you know, way back in the 80s, one of the first books was rating the corporate conscience. Uh, this word conscience is very important. And there have been movements, multinational monitor used to name the worst corporations of the, of the year. We have to be bold like this. And wherever there are issues like this, they will, because then that, then you'll get respected because you know that anybody who makes a, 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 a uh, uh, you know, harm against the consumer will get, uh, will get exposed. Project number two, and this is something also we, we said began, the state of the consumer report. Yeah? We need to know every year systematically what is the position that we have. Because if you don't have these kinds of baselines, you end up like Sisyphus, you know, the Greek god who was overthrown and made to take all the stones up the hill and when he takes it to the top of the hill it comes down and then he has to take it up again because you have no baseline you don't build and move but if you have a state of the consumer report regularly and you encourage each country to have that then you have a baseline you can shame you can say which governments are doing it not doing it and we have for example uh, uh, within the uh, something that was initiated in consumers international before on the breastfeeding movement every few years they expose them all governments all companies, whether they are complying with the basic standards that are needed to be applied. And this kind of thing is rushed for by the companies and rushed for by the, uh, by the, by the government. So the state of the consumer project idea. And the third very important is project capacity building. Every single social movement in the world, you find, they suffer very often from what is called the third generation syndrome. That is, in the third generation, they will sort of die out. So unless you build leaders, unless you build people, and, and within the consumer movement, right from the very beginning, we spend a lot of time on young activists. We did the first young activist training program. It was nearly a month training program, and it's a wonderful book called Doing It Ourselves That Developed. We trained tobacco activists, we trained health activists. Nearly 800 of the world's leading people on breastfeeding issues were trained uh, out of an arrangement that came out of Citizens International. So this capacity building element was very fundamental and for consumers international, for the consumers of the world, the interplanetary uh, commission says, spend time because any movement is not a question of having more followers. True leadership is about creating more leaders. Yeah. And if you don't invest in this kind of uh, uh, capacity building and, and train new people, then you will not have a future. The fourth is, the internet now, and uh, we have already seen now, provides us a great opportunity. But if you look at where we are, well, we will be using only 1% of the capacity of really what this whole technology is. And it's about time that we had the best gateway on consumer protection in the world. Well, this would be linked with uh, Citizens International, where everything, start off with, for example, every single document that citizens that, that uh, Consumers International has done, uh, right down from the early reports, that you can at a click with a PDF send that particular do document to inspire people anywhere in the world. You are from the Caribbean, we give you the Caribbean report of the first meeting. You are from Africa, the spirit of Nairobi, you know, the first meeting was hell. We talked about toxic uh, terrorism and how Africa is becoming a dumping ground for the waste of uh, Europe and North America. So things like that that are there from the past, which very often cannot be found. No? Now there is a huge resurgence in Arabia. We had uh, 30 years ago a classic book in Arabic called Generating Power about the consumer movement. Uh, it's very hard to even find this document anywhere. All these things should go onto the gateway and all these should be available down. Every single previous issue of International Consumer, which was the magazine, and uh, uh, in 1986, one of the world's best UN officials wrote a wonderful article on, on consumer protection in the world community. People need to read that again, but how do you get it? You can't get it. 
You just can't get it. You'll never find it. You know, maybe somebody, it's like archaeology. Somebody may find the pieces of that particular uh, paper. We need to change that. Uh, and, and this particular gateway should also be uh, tools that you can do things yourself. You can campaign. You can get information. And five, project five, uh, we, consumer lifelines. I mean, people all over the world want good information. And if you have something called consumer lifelines where people say, hey, that's the place that I can go. You know, companies have given this 000 number that you can call toll free from uh, anywhere. You can have the equivalence of that, you know, and, and, and everybody says, well, if I've got a problem and I can't find my own country or whatever it is, there's one place that I can go and that place regularly issues also key information things that you've done. And there are many, many simple models that are done by environmental movements, justice movements that come out systematically and they broadcast. Huh? They are not limited only to the members where you have to have a password to get in, you know, huh? which is the closed door system. And unfortunately, many organizations, membership organizations get trapped in that. They, they, they miss the, the, the popular mobilization part of their, of their work. So this particular gateway, uh, the, the consumer lifelines can be an amazing, amazing thing. We used to do something like that manually before, where we had about 300 journals. We took all the best uh, 90 or 100 pieces of information. Every month, we mail them out to people. Now, with the internet, you can do that just like that. Yeah? The next project, project number six, is the Consumer Champions Award. I was very inspired. Australia has got uh, that. The best each year, you know, five or the six, you know, from each continent, the best consumer activist, the best consumer champion is recognized by Citizens International and not only recognized, awarded, and the whole idea is shared with the whole community through the internet. And in this way, you begin to, you want to talk about empowering tomorrow's consumers? This is the way of empowering. Yeah? You really get them uh, going. So starting this particular uh, award and using maybe the uh, Kennedy's 50 years uh, or, you know, uh, the 25 years of the UN guidelines. I mean, these are opportunities for you to build institutions that will be uh, accelerators and multipliers for the future. Seventh project, yeah? a corporate social responsibility expose project. Yeah? You, wonderful work being done by uh, uh, ICRT, yeah? the, the, our uh, International Consumer Test Research and Testing Organization. They do three uh, corporate social responsibility, like uh, checks, detail. But this information then just goes to magazines and they're published in different countries. But we need to take that kind of information and make that into a global campaign because you're dealing with uh, corporations that are global and we have to have that kind of global response. If you don't, then you're just stuck somewhere in the place. And that's a wonderful opportunity just waiting to be, to be done. That eight is project gross national happiness. And the whole world now is moving towards gross national happiness. The, the king of Bhutan began that particular process and from there it moved on. Now they have an annual or biannual conference on uh, happiness. Countries like even France and uh, England are talking about new kinds of indicators that uh, will talk about happiness. The Consumers Association of Penang is interested. Uh, those of you who are interested, I can show you a book called The Happiness uh, Factor. There's a wonderful poster by a wonderful organization called Yes, a journal for positive futures. You know, you just go a journal for positive futures or Yes magazine, where they have 10 things science says will make you happy. Yeah, I mean, we, we, have, we, we are a force for happiness, not just an anti 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 form. And so we have to take the agenda of happiness and make that central to, to our work so CI could connect with this whole campaign of gross national uh, happiness about well-being. Yeah? Uh, and then project number nine, consumer Interpol needs to be resuscitated. We can see that product safety issue will always be with us. And to have an alert system, a systematic alert system that goes out is an amazing tool for, for action in countries, amazing tool for global uh, uh, publicity, amazing tool also to make sure that companies who break these uh, things have a price that they will pay and, and that will be a deterrent uh, for them. And 10, project 10 is Rio 2012, that's next year, uh, Rio plus 20. 20 years after Rio, we want to be in the center of the whole green business, of the environmental area. And, and maybe we have to organize 
the world consumer movement to be present there in a form in which it forms alliances with so many groups and that we are not just a fringe group that just puts up a little exhibition somewhere, but that we are part of all the major groups that are, that are involved, involved in that. And one of the beautiful things that has come out recently, and I have copies for every one of you outside, it's yellow in, uh, in color, it's yellow in color, and it is called, it's called, it was uh, the government of uh, Ecuador and some 100 over uh, civil society organizations from all over the world uh, have approved it and they want to send it to the United Nations for uh, adoption. And it is called, it's an interesting title, it's called the Universal Declaration of the Rights of Mother Earth. Universal Declaration on the Rights of Mother Earth. And it has this comprehensive, holistic picture because different groups are fighting about their own rights, but we are fighting for these rights in the context of a Mother Earth that gives us life. So what are some of the things that we have to start preserving? And this Universal Declaration uh, is going to be a, a, a topic that's going to be at the front line of many civic organizations that are looking for, for, for change. So connect uh, with this, do pick up that, otherwise go to a website called www.rightsofnature.org, you know, and this is a wonderful thing and you can load the, by, download by PDF the documents, make a thousand copies and send them or just Twitter them and whatever, you know, all the new media that, uh, that are possible. And the last, the 11, this was to counter the 11 sins also, so 11 uh, ideas from this question, is fundamentally any organization that wants to make a transformation, she has to have an organizational model that can deal with the new kind of situation in the world. Command and control center, old style hierarchical organizations are not going to be the answer. We learned that 25 years ago when we had all the global movements. So moving towards decentralized, strengthened places, projects that are placed with places where there is the best competency in the, in the world, Doing that kind of way of an organization will actually make you into something. So which place is good for a hub for what? Which place is good for a catalyst for what? Which place is good for an a incubator for what? think tanks, universities, whatever it is? You know? Which place is good for multiplying? Which place is good for accelerating? Accelerating means you, you multiply multipliers. You know? These are people who, who themselves have a way of... Uh, of, uh, of expanding. So a very, very important organizational thinking will have to go if you're going to make, if you're going to be really a global organization that is going to make transformational change. So the commission, the Intergalactic Commission, throws these 11 ideas for the future uh, to the Congress. And can we do it? Yes, of course we can. Yeah, we know about the power of one. Uh, little people doing little things in little places have changed the world, yeah? They changed the world, the power of one. And if you then move into the power of many, where we link alliances and get together as organizations, we enlarge our power and we need that because very often the, the institutions we have to address are organized. So we too have to organize and we have to organize in creative ways. And like I said, not necessarily marriages, love affairs, we work on issues together and we agree on the things that we can do together and we campaign, we use each other's resources. Uh, either you spend money and write a newsletter that goes to one million people, or you get somebody who already has a platform for one million people. Then in just one second, you are with one million people. And these are all new kinds of ways by which you operate. So the power of many. And then the power of information, of course, now, speed is there. But one of the biggest problems is that together with the speed, there must also be the kind of credible content. And so when you have a movement, that is not coming from one organization, but Citizens International and 19 other credible organizations in the world are making a statement on the nuclear disaster in Fukushima. That's a different kind of uh, situation no? that really gives you uh, uh, the power. Yeah? And then, of course, the power of the halo, all the kinds of UN instruments, you know, whether it's the ISO uh, standard uh, 2600 or whatever it is, you know, uh, UN guidelines, uh, international codes of different kinds. We have to draw from them, we have to draw from universal values with regard to rights, with regard to social justice. So the power of this halo, you know, of, of the good values that already are part of our society must be drawn on and must be part of our work. And the fifth, fifth power is one of the greatest, and that is one that is most weak in terms of 
all the social organizations that I have worked with. And that is forgetting the power of success. Wherever you have done something that has made a difference, record it, put it now on the net, make it into a story, make it into a film, and that will inspire people all over. Because if our successes are not there, you will have always the pessimists who say, it cannot be done. Now you can tell them, get out of the way. Somebody has already do, done it. Go to YouTube, you know, look at that particular uh, movie. So, uh, recognizing the power of success. So if there are stories and stories of success within the consumer movement, let us celebrate them and, and build them up and have our 999 stories that show how one person can make a change. All the champions in different uh, countries. So these powers, uh, these, these, the power of these five things can actually make us, make us uh, uh, change, you know, and then uh, one of the very important things that Rhoda Kapatkin, a former president, reminded us uh, after Cancun is do, she says, you know, move with vigor, she said, use the word vigor, to make global alliances so that this kind of power can be enlarged. Let me end, let me end with a poem, a poem by one of the greatest uh, UN officials who passed away very recently, and he's the one I referred to who wrote a wonderful article in 1986 in International Consumer, the magazine of, Citizen, of, of Consumer International. You know? he, he wrote about our work you know, in an amazing way, and people should read that, get that out, and put it on PDF and send it out. And he wrote also around that particular time a wonderful, a wonderful poem that follows what Rhoda Kapatkin talked to us about the lines. He says, use every letter you write every conversation you have, every meeting you attend to express the fundamental beliefs and dreams. Affirm to others the vision of the world you would like to see. Network through thought, network through action, network through love, network through the spirit. You are the center of a network. You are the center of the world. You are a free, immensely powerful source of life and goodness. Affirm it, spread it, radiate it, think day and night about it, and you will see a miracle happen, the greatness of your own life. In a world of big powers, big media, big monopolies, little people, billions of people, for them, networking is the new freedom the new democracy, the new form of happiness. 25 years ago, at the Consumers Union 50th anniversary, I said a few words, and I'd like to repeat them again. Citizens, Consumers International, CI, is a force for happiness. It's a force for human rights. We are a force for social justice. And we are a force for better, for a better, a kinder, and a happier world. We can do it. We must. And we will. Thank you very much, brothers and sisters.